Welcome back, Christian friends, to our continued discussion of major themes in the New Testament, a Middle Eastern view, now concentrating on the question of women in the New Testament. In our last session, we observed the fact that in the Old Testament, women had a very high place. This place was lost in the intertestament period, and that we need now to look at the New Testament and see exactly what happens to women in the text of the New Testament. The one text which we did not finish from the Old Testament last time, which has a significant influence as a background of the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, is the creation story, to which we now turn for just a brief minute as we begin. Open, if you will, please, to the first chapter of Genesis, and let's see what we read. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him, he, him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. So mankind is created from the very beginning as male and female, and together they are given authority over the earth, and together they are told to subdue it. When we look at this, we then, of course, move on to the next story, which comes in the, in, of Genesis, which occurs in chapter 3, which gives us either another story of creation or more detail of the first, whichever way you prefer to see it. And there we're told that Adam is created first and then Eve is created, and Eve is created as an Izar, the Hebrew text tells us. And so her purpose in life is to be an Izar. Now, what exactly is the word Izar? We can translate it helper. But now, what kind of a helper? You see, is this a lowly assistant? Is that what the overtones of this word mean? Somebody who sort of picks up after, after Adam and that's it? When we look at the use of this Hebrew word, Izar, we find that isn't what it means. This is a word that is used of God as God comes to help and save Israel. So in Exodus 18, verse 4, we're told, God is my Izar, my help, and my deliverer. In Deuteronomy 13, 33, verse 7, we find that God is an Izar, a help against the adversary. The same thing occurs in the same chapter in verse 26, and again in verse 29 where God comes as an Izar, as a helper, if you please, a savior. The same verb, uh, the same word, I beg your pardon, in, used in the same way, occurs in the Psalms. Psalm 33, verse 20, we are told that the Lord is our help and shield. The Lord is our Izar. And we could go on with many other verses in which this same word occurs applied to God as the one who breaks in from the outside, not as an inferior, indeed not, breaks in to help in a situation where salvation is required. And so the word applied to Eve as she is created is not that of a lowly assistant, but is a big word, the word used for God himself as God breaks into history to save Israel. Now, we notice that uh, the word would indicate she comes as Adam's superior. But no, the text makes clear that this is not the case. Had she been created out of man's head, we could say, and probably would have, that she is created to rule over him. If she had been created out of man's feet, we would say she had come that man might rule over her. But she is created from the side of man and thereby created to be his companion and to be his friend and to be his helper, to help him when he can't manage, and to be a partner with him equal to him. And then we notice also that in the same story, after the fall in the third chapter and in the 16th verse, because of the fall, we are told that the man, he shall rule over you. 
All right? The rule of the man over the woman comes as a result of the fall. Now, the question thereby we have to ask is, when the results of the fall are overcome in a new age, and the penalties of the fall are thereby removed because of the new age in Christ, what will happen to the judgment that is made as a result of the fall? And this question we'll have to leave in our minds as we come to the New Testament itself. Now, having gotten some very unfortunate, misun traditional misunderstandings of that story straightened out, let's look now and see what do we find in the New Testament regarding the women themselves and the places that they occupy both in the life of Christ and in the early church. The list is long and it is quite remarkable. The first thing we notice is that our Lord chose for himself not only men but also women as disciples. Now for this, first of all, turn if you will please to the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. And here we find a very remarkable text. We're told that Jesus is traveling through the cities and villages, preaching and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. All right, let's pause for a minute and talk about the twelve. Why did Jesus choose out of all of his disciples twelve? Well, why this number? There has to be some particular reason. The reason is fairly obvious. He's trying to flash a symbol in the presence of the people. Now, if you want people to react to a symbol, you've got to have the symbol intact. I'm privileged to live and work in Lebanon, and the symbol of the Lebanese is on their flag, the cedar tree. What if you want the Lebanese to respond to this beautiful symbol of the cedar tree? Please don't flash a symbol of the tree with half of the branches cut off. The symbol will not have a positive effect on them. They will be infuriated and it will be negative. Don't take the American flag and ask Americans to respond positively to this symbol and leave the stars out of the blue patch up in the corner. This will make Americans mad and they'll wonder who's trying to insult us. And this is true of anybody's symbol. If you want them to respond to that symbol, it has to be intact. You can't fiddle with it. Now, why does Jesus choose 12? The obvious answer is he is flashing a symbol before the Jewish people and saying to them, in my followers, we are making a new bold step because I and my followers are the new Israel. And in the new Israel, the promises of the old Israel are to be fulfilled. In the new kingdom of God, gathered around the new Moses, who is our Lord himself, we find the new people of God. And Paul himself talks about the church as the Israel of God. And in Ephesians, he talks about joining, being citizens, the believers become fellow citizens with the saints in the new Israel. So this symbol of the twelve tribes, symbolized in the twelve apostles, has to be twelve men. Why? Because the original twelve tribes were led by twelve men. Now what if the original twelve tribes had been led by ten men and two women? In that case, our Lord would have been obliged to have chosen ten men and two women. If it had been six sisters and six brothers, his twelve apostles would have been six brothers and six sisters. He didn't choose twelve men because men are instinctively superior to women. He chose twelve men because the symbol he's trying to flash before the people has in it twelve men. All right. Now, we are told then in Luke 8 and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, verse 3, and Johanna, the wife of, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others 
who provided for them out of their means. Now this text to me is incredible for a number of reasons, amazing. First of all, we find a rabbi with women disciples. Now, the amazing part of this is that the, the Jewish rabbis, so far as we know, never had any women disciples. And here is a rabbi who does. And the women are mentioned. They are mentioned by name. They are traveling with him. You know, afterwards he went on through the cities and villages preaching and bringing the good news. He's on tour, and the tour group includes men and women. Of course, as they would sleep in various villages as they go, uh, they would sleep in separate homes. Of course, it would be unthinkable any other way. It's not that there's anything improper here. It's the fact that our Lord not only has women disciples, they are a part of his traveling band. Now, the thing that amazes me is we couldn't do this in the Middle East today. Our Lord did it in the first century. And even more than that, the women are paying for the movement. It's the Ladies' Palestinian Aid Society that makes it possible for the tour to go on. I mean, of course, he and his friends would be entertained uh, in some homes on occasion and fed, but there are times in which they have to buy their own food as they go about from village to village, and it's the ladies who are doing the paying. They've dug up the money for this thing to go on. Had it not been for their finance, Jesus could not have gone from village to village, and even more than that, the men admit it. You know, here it's in the text. Ben Sirach, that we, who, from whom we quoted in our last study, says it is a terrible shame for a man to be supported by his woman, by his wife. All right, here we've got Jesus of Nazareth supported by these women who out of their means make it possible for him to do the preaching which he does. Now, it's not only here that we know that there are women disciples. Turn ahead in Luke, if you will, please. I trust you have a New Testament with you, to Luke chapter 10, and let's take a look at verse 39. Now, in this text, we've got the famous story of Mary and Martha, in which Martha is busy in the kitchen, and uh, Mary is listening to Jesus, and then Martha is upset. And so she says, you know, please tell my sister to help me. And Jesus answers, she, you leave her alone. She has chosen the better part. Now, what is the point? The point has to do with our Middle Eastern culture. Because the text says, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet. Now, to sit at the feet of a rabbi in the first century means to become one of his disciples. Mary is not just upset over the fact that she needs help in the kitchen. She is even more upset over the fact that this rabbi has women disciples and, my word, my sister has become one of them and what are the neighbors going to say? And she's upset over the fact that this very unusual and very remarkable and very revolutional reality has taken place. My sister has become a student of theology and is out there studying with these men. Women aren't supposed to go to seminary. And Jesus' answer is, she has chosen the better part. I would rather have her as a seminary student learning from me than to have a finer meal prepared for me by you. And so that's critical for us to see as another woman who has become a disciple. Let's try another place. Turn, please, to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 49. Now, in this case, Mary and the brothers of Jesus have come to him, and they want to talk to him, and he doesn't respond in the way that a Middle Easterner usually does to his extended family. 
Verse 40, 48, we're told, but he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Now, in the Middle East, it is impossible, it is absolutely impossible for a man to stretch out his hand toward a group of men and say, here is my mother and my brothers. You can't do it. It is simply culturally unthinkable. If you're going to reach out to a group of people with your hand and say, here is my mother and my brothers, they've got to be men and women. He says, here is my mother and my brothers and my sister and so on. He can say, here is my brother and my father and my cousin and my nephew. Okay, that's all right. But we are told he reaches out his hand to his disciples and says, here is my mother and my brothers. And then finally, in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 36, we are told, now there was at Joppa a disciple named Thabita. And so here the Greek word for disciple is used for a woman. All right, first revolution is Jesus, unlike all the other rabbis around him, had women disciples, and he teaches specific lessons for their benefit, as we will see. And the second thing we notice in the New Testament is that there are women teachers. The women teachers show up for us in three very specific places. One of the most important is in Acts chapter, eight, chapter 18. Turn to chapter 18 of Acts, if you will, please, and let's take a look at verse, starting in verse 24. What happens? A very famous preacher from Alexandria by the name of Apollos shows up in Ephesus, starts doing a little preaching, but he hasn't got his theological head screwed on, right? And he doesn't understand about the Holy Spirit, and so we're told that um, Priscilla and Aquila start to help him out. Let's read from verse 26. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and expounded to him the way of God more accurately. So here we have a lady seminary professor, and she is doing part of the teaching. It's not Aquila who teaches this famous preacher. It's Priscilla and Aquila, and Priscilla is mentioned first, as she always is, in the New Testament, and may have been the outstanding amongst the two of them. In any case, both of them are involved in the instruction of this famous preacher. Now, more than that, we notice from the first chapter of Luke, in verse 46 to verse 55, a text that we will return to in our next study, that Mary sings a great hymn, a theological hymn, from which we extract some of the great themes of the gospel. Luke, by incorporating that hymn of Mary, she may have sung many hymns, may have been the author of many hymns, we don't know, but Luke incorporates this great hymn into his gospel and thereby makes Mary the teacher of the entire church. Mary is the first theologian of the gospel, and we will look at that in uh, next time. And then also, turn, if you will, please, to John chapter 20, starting in verse 16. This is the story of the resurrection. And what happens in John 20, 16? Mary appear, uh, Jesus appears to Mary and we have a very beautiful and touching scene of recognition in the garden, and then Jesus says to Mary, Go to my brethren and say to them. Now, what is the language that he is using? This is the specific language that was used all through the ancient Middle East and is still used today in areas where people need verbal messages sent of the person who sends a message sending an oral message to someone else. 
the prophets of the Old Testament, whenever they began to speak, always introduced their words with the phrase, Thus says the Lord. And the phrase was taken from the world of the oral letter. If I want to send you a letter and you can't write, I bring a messenger and I say to him, you go to Susie or to Joe and you say to them, thus says Ken Bailey. Then I break into the first, into the first person. I say Joe such and such or I say Susie such and such. And then that person goes, finds you wherever you are. If he's got to cross international boundaries, it doesn't matter. He finds you, he stands in front of you, and he says, thus says Ken Bailey. Then he recites the message in the first person. And this classical prophetic form is the one Jesus is now using. Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. It was the women who came and taught to the disciples the astounding reality of the fact of the resurrection. The Jewish community said the witness of women is not reliable. The Christian answer was, we no longer accept that. We believe women's witness is reliable, and they were witnesses to the resurrection. So we find women disciples, we also find women teachers. Now, third, we find in the New Testament women prophetesses. This is in Acts chapter 21, verse 9. We will not pause to turn to it. You may care to in your study. And look at that and see that we are told about Philip and his daughters who prophesied. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're told about the men when they pray and prophesy are supposed to dress in this fashion, and the women when they pray and prophesy are to dress in this fashion. Because we spend our time looking as to how they are to dress, we forget the fact that Paul says both the men and the women are prophets, and they're by leaders. Then fourth, we find that the women in the New Testament are deacons. Everybody look, please, to the 16th chapter of Romans. Now, uh, our translations quite often sort of, in a sense, um, deceive us. If you, if you can, please, take a quick look also at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. And there in 1 Timothy 4, 6, we are told, if you put these instructions before the brethren, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is the minister of the church there in Ephesus, and the whole book is instruction as to how Timothy is supposed to run his pastorate. He's the pastor, he's the minister, and how it's instruction as to how he might go about his task. And the word Greek in Greek for minister is diakonos, because the word diakonos in the New Testament means a minister. Now, you see, we have the same word in Romans chapter 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a diakonia of the church in Senchria. Now, why? Christian friends, do we take the same Greek word, and when it's applied to a man in 1 Timothy 4, 6, we translate it minister, and when it applies to a woman in Romans 16, 1, we translate it deacon or deaconess. And I submit to you, the reason is we've decided ahead of time that, of course, women can't be ministers, so they can't possibly be leaders of churches. And so, well, what are we going to do with Romans 16, 1? Well, we'll fiddle with it, and we'll come out with another word that doesn't quite mean minister. Paul himself talks about himself as a diakonos, a minister. And whenever it applies to Paul, we also translate it as minister. This lady is obviously the head of this church, and she is being commended as the minister of that church. Then. 
Amazingly, also in Romans 16, keep moving down the same text on the same page and come to verse 7. It says, Greet Andronicus and Junius, my fellow kinsmen and fellow prisoners. And the Revised Standard Version reads, They are men of note among the apostles. This translation is what the women call a sexist translation, and at this point their criticism is fair. The word men does not occur in the Greek text, which merely tells us they are notable among the apostles. And then we begin to examine our old texts of the book of Romans, and we find that the very oldest among them, there isn't any S in the word junius. In fact, it reads Junia, and Junia is a lady's name. And you see in verse 3 of this same chapter, we are told about Prisca, which is another way of saying Priscilla, and Aquila. There's a man and his wife. And now in verse 7, we're told about Andronicus, that's a man's name, and Junia, and that's a lady's name. And we're told that they are kinsmen of Paul, they are fellow prisoners, and they are notable among the apostles. Now, um, this text has been traced by some very able Roman Catholic scholars, and they have observed the fact that the very first commentary ever written on the book of Romans, which comments on this text with an S on it, and describes Junia as a man, with an S, is the 13th century. When I discovered this, it blew my mind. When you go back, for example, to the early Greek fathers, and the greatest, perhaps, of them uh, who commented faithfully on the New Testament is John Chrysostom of Antioch and then of Constantinople, one of the great Christian preachers of all the centuries. And in his commentary on the book of Romans, this is now in the fourth century. He comments on this text. We've got his sermons. And he comes to it and he says, Look at the faith of this woman who is so outstanding that she is not only called an apostle, but she is called outstanding among the apostles. And then he goes on to tell the women in front of him, You women believers, get busy. There is a lady apostle who was outstanding among the apostles. And so you have this spiritual heritage that you have to try and live up to. And Origen of Alexandria in the third century, about 225, has a similar comment. No apologies made, uh, no attempt to cover this up, no attempt to explain it away. In the third and the fourth century, apparently, the church knew that there was a lady apostle. Later on, apparently, the position of the women fell in the church, and so the men started copying in an S, and then by the Middle Ages, they start reinterpreting the text, and they start telling us that, no, these are two men, and finally we called them men of note, because, of course, there couldn't be a lady apostle. What happened? What happened was that when you're back in Palestine, and Jesus chooses 12 apostles because he's trying to make a symbolic statement to the Jews, all 12 of them have to be men. But the minute the church broke out of Palestine, and now they're pro proclaiming the gospel to the Greeks, and these Greeks have never heard of the 12 tribes of Israel, the symbol doesn't mean anything to them, it doesn't ring any bells in their minds or in their heads or their hearts, it is now a possible for the top leadership of the church to include some women, and it did. Here is a lady apostle. And finally, we find in 1 Timothy chapter 5, there, is, there are lady elders. We've again fiddled with the translation, and we have called them older women, merely because younger women are also mentioned in the text. But if we turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, we find Peter talking about elders and their responsibility, and in the process of discussing the elders, 
he discusses the younger men. And so, and when we find him discussing younger men, we do not say in our minds, well, he can't be talking about the elders of the church, the officers of the church, because he's mentioning younger men. No, it simply triggers in his mind, having mentioned the elders, he then mentions those over whom these elders have authority. And the same is true in 1 Timothy. Chapter 4 talks about the elders laying their hands upon you. And in chapter 5, he tells Timothy, now you treat these elders well, the elders who are men and the elders who are women. You treat them well and do your responsibilities to them. We fiddled with that. And when the word presbyteros clearly means the elders laying their hands on the church, we translate it elders. And when the same word shows up in the next text, we say, no, it means older women and older men. All right, so here we are. We have found that the majority of the leaders of the early church were men. But we have also found that at every level of the life of the church, whether they be disciples or teachers or prophets or deacons or ministers or apostles or heads of churches or elders, there was available and open in the life of the early church as recorded in the scriptures inspired by God and given to us, there was a place open for women. And we must somehow wrestle with the reality of this data. And we must see the fact that this is what the New Testament church created in the new vision of the equality of men and women before God. And we must somehow wrestle with the other texts to which we will turn in these studies in the light of the reality of this amazing list which we have gone through in these moments.